Adrian Van. She was a partner and director of a successful dairy farm for 25 years. She's also been a director and chairperson of two dairy farm related businesses. Uh, she's trained succession facilitator and a family farm business facilitator. And armed with all these skills, she provides succession planning for farming families and other farm bu family businesses. So now oh, I'll let, hand you over to Shan. Gosh, thank you, Karen. <laughs> Follow that. Um, yeah, but I'm not going to talk about succession today. I'm talking about time management, which nicely ties in with Con's paper and what Aidan has been talking about before. Now, I have to say from the start, I am not an expert on time management, right? Okay, um, but I think I've been asked to do this because I did present a session in the uh, Wealth Creation course in 2016 on time management. And I have read a lot, read a lot about it and I'm very interested in, in how we manage time, particularly now when um, uh, there's all these, these MRI scans now that examine our brain and how our brain works. And actually a lot of these tools now work with your brain and, and maximize that. So it's really important to think about that. So that's why I'm here, I think, anyway. And it's going to be a short session. So time management. Well, first of all, it's a, a misnomer because we can't manage time. Time just is, isn't it? So what we're doing is managing ourselves and managing our energy to give optimum performance. Um, the first thing to think of then is how do we manage time as we are now? And I'm afraid to say that we kid ourselves. All of us kid ourselves or how busy we are or, you know, we haven't got time for this or we haven't got time for that. We do kid ourselves. So the first place to start is to do an activity log. Now, when I read about this and I thought I had to do this, I thought, oh, God, I can't be bothered to do this. It sounds really boring. But it was incredibly interesting once I'd done it. So what you do is you go on to Excel or something like that. You get seven days a week on a sheet and you split the seven days into half-hour slots. And for a week, and it has to be a typical week, you fill in each half hour slot of what you did in that half hour. As I say, to me, I thought, oh my God, that sounds so boring. But it was incredibly interesting. First of all, when I looked at it afterwards, you realize how you, uh, again, how you kid yourself. And so it's important to look at actually how you're spending that time. And then you look at the diagnostics, because that's the important bit. So look at, where you are spending that time. Now, we've heard about, you know, we've just been talking about the big why. Why are you wanting to do this? Why, what are your priorities in life? Well, are you spending time on your priorities or are you wasting time? And this activity log will actually tell you what, you, what you're doing. And you can ask the questions, you know, in that activity there, did I need to do it? Could I have delegated it to somebody else? Or did it need to be done at all? I've also used in the uh, proceedings, I've got there a quadrant that, that's based on Stephen Covey's quadrant. And so it's a good idea to put those activities into each quadrant. It's on page 39, the top of page 39. And to be honest with yourself and say, right, okay, um, are those activities you know, productive? Or am I kidding myself? Or are they a complete waste of time altogether? So be honest with yourself. And then make sure that it fits with your priorities. Now, as I said, it was the previous paper was talking about priorities. Another way then to look at priorities, after you've done your activity log, is to think about something that quite a lot of people like, and that is the Pareto principle. That is what we know as the 80-20 rule. Now, all of us know that the 80-20 rule is that 80% of your results come from 20% of your activities. So think about that for a minute. When you're, at, you know, when you're on the farm, say, for instance, and you've got a busy day, out of that day, 80% of your results come from 20% of the things that you do. So what are those 20% things? Again, it's setting priorities. And if you say, oh, well, you know, when I'm working, I'm working hard all day and everything's important, you're kidding yourself. Because if you want to come to the Positive Farmers Conference or you want to go to a discussion group, you find the time to do it and you make sure that the 20% things are done, and those are your 20%. So think about that, but don't think about it just for work. Think about it for relationships as well. Um, for instance, spending quality time with your children, that sort of thing. You know, what are the 20% things that you spend with your relationships with your children? And also for yourself and your self-care. What are the 20% things for my self-care? 
you know, is it sitting watching box sets of Game of Thrones? Or is it going for a walk or going to the gym or doing something like that? You know, what are your 20% things? So it's, again, looking at your principles. That's the Pareto principle. Okay, the next thing then is to think about, right, how am I going to plan this? So the first thing is, how do I plan a year? And you can go to a, a stationery shop and you can get a big yearly planner and stick that on your wall. And I would suggest it is in one, you know, one big sheet. And you stick it on your wall and you start putting on it the things that are, go that are going to happen for the year. It's incredibly effective. It's very simple. You stick it on your office wall or your kitchen or whatever. And you plan out, you block out, right, okay, we're going to be carving in the next few weeks. That's, that's the carving bit. We're going to have a bit of a break and then it's service. So what are we going to do in that break? Well, okay, we might have a holiday there. You know, you start looking, you can see the year in one look, and that's quite important. So your yearly planner, get that done. What are going to be the goals for the year? What are your key performance indicators for the year? Put that on your yearly planner as well. So you're planning for something. And if you've got a big goal for the year, you're able to split it up so you know exactly how far you're going to get in each month. So you've got your yearly planner. The next thing is then, to break it down into weekly plans. What do I need to do this week? Now, I came across a great saying, and it is, um, you plan it before you're in it. So you don't plan your week on a Monday morning. You plan your week on a Friday afternoon. And this works scientifically because your brain is actually working on it over the weekend. And so you're actually going to be more efficient by the time you hit the ground running on a Monday morning. So on a Friday afternoon, plan for what you're going to do next week. And for goodness sake, always give contingency time because things always happen that you're not, not, not expecting and, and things often take longer than you think. And there's nothing more demotivating than having a plan and then it going out of the window because something um, un, un, unexpected happens. So make sure you put in plenty of time for everything and, uh, and time enough for things to come up that are unexpected. So do that on a Friday. And then you break it down again to your daily plan. What am I going to do tomorrow? As I said, plan it before you're in it. So you should do it a couple of minutes, 10 minutes in the afternoon or evening. Right, what am I going to do tomorrow? Again, it's working with your brain because your brain is working on that subconsciously at night so that you're far more efficient, more likely to be far more efficient next morning when you do it. It's also interesting as well to understand that your energy levels are different during the day. We all know this, but we often don't bother to work with our energy levels. Now, science tells us that if you want to do mental activities, you do them in the morning. So you shouldn't be doing your accounts at you know, half past seven on a Thursday night or whatever. You should be doing your mental activities in the morning and doing your physical activities in the afternoon. So if you've got something that's complex, or, you know, that uh, requires a decision-making, you should be doing it in the morning because that's when your brain is at its optimal level. Really interesting, isn't it? So that's your to-do lists. So all those things, you know, your yearly planner, your weekly planner, your to-do list for the day. You also need then, the mo one of the most important things to add on to that is either a diary or a journal. Because once you've done these things, you need to assess how it's working. And so you need to, at that Friday afternoon when you're planning the following week, spend a couple of minutes saying, right, okay, how did it work? Did it work? What do I need to adjust? And, you know, what have I learnt about it? Can I do it better in, in the future? So you, you're, you're constantly learning about managing your time because this is what really successful people do. Now, a little note about procrastination. Putting off from uh, today what, you know, to tomorrow because you can't be bothered to do it or you don't want to do it. We all procrastinate, procrastinate. And I probably was really expert at it. But I came across a technique a number of years ago and it has actually transformed my life, right? It has really transformed my life. And it's called the Pomodoro effect, or the Pomodoro um, uh, technique. And it was in, uh, invented by an Italian. And a Pomodoro is Italian for a tomato. And what it was, this Italian used one of those kitchen timers that looked like a tomato, so that's why it's called the Pomodoro uh, technique. 
And what you do is, if you've got something and you keep on putting it off, and I'm doing it all the time, you know, and if you keep on putting it off, you get your timer, I use my phone actually, right, but I get my timer on my phone, and I say, right, I'm going to set it for 25 minutes, not 30 minutes, not 20 minutes, 25 minutes, I'm going to set it for 25 minutes, and for that 25 minutes, I'm going to concentrate solely on doing that job. Now, I don't have to finish it, I just concentrate solely on it. And here we come to talk about focus. Um, these days, we're, we're getting less and less able to focus on things because we're being distracted by our phones and, and stuff like that. So it's important when you do your 25 minutes of the Pomodoro that you turn off your phone. There's a, you know, there is a, a voicemail there, so people can leave a message. You don't go and check your emails. You put your phone away, if you like. You, you, know, you concentrate and focus for that 20 minutes on that task. And apparently, science tells us that it actually works well with our brains, because if you sat down and said, oh, God, I've got to do the pa cattle passports, the calf passports today, I'll sit down and I'll do them. That doesn't work very well with your brain. Whereas if you say, I'll spend the next 25 minutes doing cattle passports, and it doesn't matter if I don't finish them, apparently that, that stimulates the brain much more. Science tells you that, not me, right? So... 25 minutes concentrating on that, and it will transform you. I'm telling you, it absolutely does. And so, using that focus, and as I say, we're so bad at focusing now, and, and, it, and really successful people, they are, have that ability to focus. And, you know, uh, the other thing that we've been told as well is that it's quite clever to be multitasking. Well, science is now telling us that multitasking is a big mistake, because instead, we cannot think of more than one thing at a time. And so when we're multitasking, we're not thinking of two things, we're flicking between the two things. Our brain is flicking between things at the, at the same time. And it's actually terribly tiring, and also it uh, messes with your focus and you're not as effective. So actually focusing on one thing is really important, really important, and we're quite bad at that these days. So that's your procrastination on the Pomodoro thing. The last thing then, that the last tool, is the easiest one of all and it's saying no. Um, often we have our own priorities, but other people come along and try and get us to work in with their priorities. We have to have the ability to say no. And so the best thing is when somebody comes along to you and asks you whether you do something for them, best thing to say, first of all, is to say, oh, can I get back to you? So you go away from that and think about it. And if it, if it ties in with what your, you know, your priorities are, is something you want to do, that's fine. But if it isn't, find a nice way of saying no, okay? Because that is the most important thing. And so that, and that goes for work, that goes for personal relationships, and it goes, for, again, for your self-care. Um, and so it, that also goes for phone calls. If you're very busy and you're focusing, put your, voice, you know, put your phone on voicemail. Don't answer it. Go back, get back to people later on. And by the most successful people only check their emails certain times of the day. They don't, you know, the phone pings, oh, I'll check that email straight away. They check it perhaps once or twice, you know, two or three times a day they check their emails. And then they have the time to reply and all that type of thing. So say no. Learn to say no. So that's it, really. So what are the benefits of, of, of time management? Well, you, you prioritize. You understand your priorities and, uh, prior, priorities and you work on them. You're more productive. You have a balance in life, because you can work on a balance in life once you understand your priorities. You can reach your goals, because you plan for them. And it's less panic and less stress, and that's what we all want, I'm sure. So in conclusion, sort out your priorities, focus on what you're doing at the time, and be mindful of how you spend your time. And I'll finish with a quotation that I have over my desk in my office, and it says, if you don't have time for things that matter, Stop doing things that don't. Uh, very insightful from Sean. Um, now we all have to think about what we need to do there with our honest activity logs to analyse how we spend our weeks and then break down how we're going to go and react to that by having a yearly planner, a weekly planner, and a daily planner, and take out some time to actually 
plan our week ahead or our day ahead. It, it can be very effective. And I love that idea of the Pomodoro technique, 25 minutes, because usually if a job is something you don't want to do, what you really need to do is start. And if you know you're only going to do it for 25 minutes, you can start. Um, can we take questions on that? Donal Dempsey, I'm sure you have a question down there. <laughs> One thing I find, Shan, is multitasking is disastrous. Mm. I decide I'm going to go and do something, and then something I see, suddenly I see something else, and I go, oh, I must do that, and then I stop, and I go and do something else again. Yeah, I, I read about how, this how recently. How do you yeah. that? How do um, you? Well, by the way, I've got, a, I've got a reading list in the proceedings as well, because as I said, I, I, I do enjoy, I do read a lot, and I do enjoy reading about this, so there is a reading list there for, for those of you who are interested. Um, yeah. It, I, it was interesting when I read about this, I thought, oh, crikey, you know, because particularly we women sort of say, aren't we clever? You know, we multitask. Well, the joke's on us because it's, it's bad because we're not focusing. As they say, we're flicking between things all the time. And it's just we're, we're not, you know, we're, we're tiring ourselves out and we're not making good decisions because we're not focusing enough. So, yeah, you've got to just say, right, OK, it's the Pomodoro thing. I'm going to spend 25 minutes on this and I'm not going to be distracted. And, and that's it. Yeah. And it can be mentally exhausting to do multitasking as oh, well. Absolutely. Because you, and you get no satisfaction out of finishing a task properly because you've kind of half done everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and you need satisfaction, you know. You need to be sitting at the end of the day. And, and, you know, people have asked me, there are apps you can have to-do lists on apps and things like that. Um, and that's fine. But there's nothing beats the satisfaction of having a list that you've written and you can, you know, write, cross it out as you go along. It, it's, it's very satisfying to be able to do that. But there are apps. There are free apps. I've got one on my phone. It's called Todoist. And it's a free app. And it links in with my laptop as well. So, um, and incidentally, with the books, particularly the one it's called um, Off the Clock, they have websites, and so they have other tools on those websites. So you can go onto the, the websites, particularly the one Off the Clock, and there are sort of other tools that you can use as well. So, you know, I recommend having a look at those as well. Because, you know, if we want to be effective, we've got to be serious about managing time and, you know, setting those priorities and uh, spending time with our family and all those sort of things are so important. Aidan, do you find yourself good at uh, time management? Um, I think what works best for me is uh, to go away from other people. If I need to write an article or something, go away into a room where there's nobody else around. So you're focusing? You just focus on that. There's actually no windows in this room that I go to. I just get down to and do my, do my work. And it might take two or three hours. And time actually goes quite fast when you're just focusing on it and you're not looking yeah. at yeah, it. Yeah, But I, I have a question for you, Shannon. Like, biggest challenge I find is I be doing something, like you check the phone scroll on Twitter or something, check WhatsApp. How do you, how do you manage that? Or like, I can see my productivity declining big time whenever I do that. Like, but is there ways of kind of weaning yourself off? Yeah, I think doing the, the activity log, because it gives you a shock, mm. you know, because you're saying, oh, you know, I, I wanted to join the gym, or I want, to, I want to go and play rugby or whatever, but I haven't got the time. And then you look at your log and you think, right, okay, for how many hours in that week did you spend surfing through the net doing nothing in particular? And you think, crikey, I could have played you know, half a dozen games of rugby there. Mm. So, um, you know, it's, it's being realistic about this. Because we do waste, I mean, we all do it. You know, we do waste time, you know. You know, you sort of see something in the internet, think, well, that's quite interesting. And then you follow something else. And in the end, you're watching kittens doing something. <laughs> or, you know, and it's, yeah. you know, it's such a waste of time. And we do do it. We all do it. We get, we sort of, it's like the, the, a rabbit burrow. You get, once you go down there, you don't get out. And so being more aware of what you're doing and looking at your activity log. And I've decided I'm going to do an activity log a couple of times a year just to make sure that, you know, I'm back on track again. Yeah. Because so phones are like a blessing and a curse. Really. Oh, yeah, they are. Yeah. And you've got to be disciplined about that. And you read it all the time, you know, about these very successful people. And they say, right, OK, you know, I don't, when my phone pings with an email, I don't look at it. I, I, I only look at my emails, you know, 9 o'clock and 12 o'clock and 5 o'clock or whatever, you know. And, and being disciplined. And that's, that's the other thing. There are two words I think we're losing touch with. And one, one was focus and the other, the other one is discipline. And I think, you know, those are very important. If we want to be really effective, then we need to be able to focus and we need to be disciplined about it as well. Uh, could we just get a microphone over here to Mike, Mike McGann, please? I think we're not very good at dealing with some of these softer issues that we're dealing with here now as farmers, but I find, in the last few years, I've found taking a day every so often that nobody might even know where you are. 
Go to a favorite spot that you always wanted to go to. For example, I went to the Devil's Bit this year. I passed the Devil's Bit for years and never got near it. So I went for a walk up the Devil's Bit this year and spent about three or four hours up around that area, a fantastic part of the country. And I've picked spots like this in different parts of the country that I just go to and enjoy, believe it or not, my own company yeah. for a day without the phone, without the busy you know, things that we all get, think we have to do and that we can't not do. And yet we find when we go back that evening or tomorrow, hey, that was nice, we'd actually manage without you. So just a, a day for yourself is actually a terrific battery recharging exercise. Mm -hmm. And it gets your head right and it gets your sort of detox from this hustle and bustle that we found ourselves in. And as more and more technology, we're just busier and busier. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just unwind from that. And well, that's what works for me. I'm not saying it work for everybody. Yeah. But try something like that. Just a day to yourself. Be kind to yourself for a day and just get away. I think that's a great idea. I think occasionally we have to stop the world because it's coming in at us, even with, because of the phones, it's coming at us all day, all night, and no matter where you go. So we have another question down there. Hello. Um, I was just wondering how the point about saying no to people then fits with being a sort of a member of a collaborative team or possibly managing a team because you want to be, to a certain extent, you want to be accessible. Um, and, in, and, and encouraging and, and helpful to your fellow team members, but you don't want that to be a, a detriment to being able to focus yourself. I wonder if there's any way to balance those two points. Um, I think if you're working with a team, you need to be setting a good example. And so saying to your team, I am not available at certain times, actually sets a good example to everybody else to say, it's okay to not be on, you know, on, on call 24-7. Because that, that's the tendency now, because of mobile phones and because of all the technology, you know, uh, we're finding that people are uh, on sort of on call, all of us, for 24-7. That's not acceptable and it's not good for our mental health. And so saying, setting guidelines for everybody and saying, right, okay, I am not available at this time. And we, I've, see, I've read of lots of uh, companies, particularly these big companies like Google and all those modern companies now, where they, they're doing that type of thing, where they're saying, right, okay, there are boundaries here and setting boundaries. And, you know, it's, it's, it's self-preservation, but it's also respect for yourself and, re and, and other people having to learn to respect your time as well. And I think that's important to, to set that. Um, but yes, as I say, uh, going on then, you know, to having what Mike was saying about having a, a day off and everything, in these big technology companies now like Apple and Google and all that, they're actually trying to work less, you know, and, and they are setting those guidelines as well. And I know of one person, I know he's, a, he's a, an accountant, and what he's decided to do is he's not working Fridays anymore. He doesn't work at weekends anyway, and he's not working on Fridays anymore now because he likes woodwork. And so he's woodworking on a Friday. And he said he's far more productive now than he was before because he's got to do the work in four days. And he said he wastes a lot less time. So it's interesting, you know, how mm. you can manage that. There is an expression, the, the work expands to fill the time allotted for its completion. And I, I used to, before I became a photographer, I used to work in quality control in a lab. And I, I had brought it down to three days a week because we had three kids. And the, the amount of work I got done in three days would have taken me five days if I had five days. You know, so it is very interesting that you can give yourself time off. It's just a question of kind of organizing it. And I love Mike's idea. Occasionally, um, if Donald ca isn't coming home, if he's got uh, something on, uh, I'm on my own for lunch and I'll actually go into a restaurant with my notebook and I'll actually write. I'll write plans, I'll write thoughts, and it's a fantastic luxury. And I come away out of it feeling rejuvenated and that, yeah, I've stopped the world for a few minutes. I now know which direction I'm going. You know, so just a thought. What do you do, Aidan, to, um, if people are asking you too many things, how do you say no in the nicest possible way? I don't say enough, say no enough times to some people. Uh, look at Mike Murphy. I know, well, I can join you on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I turned to him this morning, uh, like um, Lyle and Hardy, another fine mess you've gotten me into. <laughs> Just one thing I did notice, that I was away in New Zealand and Australia before Christmas. One of the farmers there, he, he, when I email him, his response back is he only checks his emails every second day. 
and it's an automatic response, you know, and he said, don't fear, I've, I'll see you it and I'll come back to you. He will come back to you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that you can, anyone can do an automatic response in their email. If you had the same for WhatsApp or text messages, I think it would be a good, a good thing to have. Yeah. You know? I, I think what happens as well is that you often, f uh, you do the weekly planner and you kind of think to yourself, that's fine, my week is looking comfortable now and I've left time in for my friends and family. And then somebody rings you, I'm desperate, I need this done, I need that done or whatever. And you end up saying yes. And it puts you under so much pressure instead of saying, look, actually, I'm not available, but I can recommend somebody else or I can help you some other way. And I think it's just to kind of prioritize. That's the word I think that's coming through from both your papers. Prioritize what's important. Um, we did a SWAT at one stage and we had to ask on ourselves and we had to ask family members to do SWATs on us. And my daughter said, one of my weaknesses is that I say no, or I say yes to everyone, but no to her. And that was a kick in the heart. I mean, wow. So. Just a thought again. Any other questions, lads? We're going, we're, we're, we were all very efficient here. <laughs> we're time managing very well. We are, we are. <laughs> um, Mike, Mike McGann or Mike Murphy, I'd say you have another few questions there now because I'd say you tend to say yes to things as well or are you very disciplined about managing your time? I've been trying to say no to Mike Murphy to, uh, to be oh, well. chairman of this <laughs> session with him, but... Um, I thought, I thought Mike was going to complain about the squares hadn't enough, hadn't enough squares left for his life. Because I, I was at his birthday party in New Zealand recently, and it was 120 years old he was, so it's a... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I jest. But on a very much more serious note, I've had a really, really tragic... Your story made me think about a story similar in our lives. And it really, really made, struck a chord with me, because... You just don't get back time yeah. that you didn't spend with somebody. If something, if, if the outcome had been worse for you, you wouldn't have got back all of those things you would have loved to have done with Donal or you still plan to do. So I'm saying to everybody in the audience that, that has somebody that they care about or love, spend, make special time to be with them. Do the plan, that, do the holiday you were going to do in five years time, do it this year. Do the, do the little things that go to dinner, go away for a, 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 a weekend. Things that you will never get back if something tragic happens. I, I'm at a stage in my life where I, I've seen too many, I've buried too many friends. And I've seen too many tragic situations. And it, the common theme you'd hear from the mafters was we didn't get time to do such and such. Regret. We wanted to do. Don't live with regrets. Okay, if you can't, you can't buy back what's gone, but you can certainly manage what's to come. And if you could just find some time to do those little... And I said, I never expected to be having this conversation at a Positive Farmers Conference, but given that this is where this session is going, mm. I can't emphasize enough to the, the, the younger people in the audience particularly to make more time for the ones you love. Because you just don't know what's coming. And I was really struck with your comment about power of attorney and that. But linked to that, there's two other very important things. You mentioned one, and I'm not sure if you mentioned the other, but I'm going to mention it. One is a will. Yeah. Make a will. Whatever about the, powers, the, the um, power of attorney. Everybody make a will. I've made five of them at this stage because you need to constantly You need to update them. it regularly, so yeah. everybody make a will. And the other thing is, that really harsh thing, the succession story, have you had the succession conversation? Do you know whether the person, if you're my age, have you signed over? If you haven't, do it. If, you're not, if you have signed over, make sure everybody is, is comfortable and is aware of, of what you are doing. Because these are the things that, the last thing you want to do is leave a mess. a mess. And there's so many messes in Irish farms, and I'm sure the UK farmers have the same experience. Yeah. But we're not good at dealing with these kind of things. So I was very, very lucky. My father gave me half the farm on my 21st birthday. So really, really imaginative person. That's not today or yesterday. And we've lived by that kind of thing. Everybody knows what's happening in our family. And I think that's the kind of thing that we, you, you, you owe it to the next generation to deal with these sort of issues. So. Your story, power of attorney, 
Second one, make a will. And third one, have the succession conversation if it isn't already decided. I, th I think often the succession conversation, people are afraid of it. And I think also it causes so much anxiety in people's heads that they actually do nothing about writing a will. So I think at that stage, they need to bring in professional help to help them with the succession. Uh, and I mean, even you've got a lot of experience with that. I didn't pay it, honestly. No, she didn't. She didn't. There isn't a fiver coming across here. But it's just, I, I am aware of that. So I think um, it's good advice. Um, I think also, just a, just a personal thought, I think happiness, people are striving for happiness the whole time and they expect it to come in chunks. It doesn't. It comes in fleeting moments, in my opinion, and I think savour those moments. Um, and also ordinary days can be great and to realise that you were happy today because it's an ordinary day, you just don't know it because you don't know what's coming tomorrow. That's a kind of a pessimistic, optimistic kind of way of looking at it, but today is a great day. So let's enjoy it. Um, um, do we have another question from Mike Murphy there? More, more comment with the philosophizing. It's, um, you, you, um, when you get to a certain age, you tend to prioritize what's really important in life. And um, I mean, pr probably a couple of things, a slight bit of repetition now, but it's probably no harm. Warren Buffett, uh, who people probably know as the third or fourth richest man in the world, he was asked, what was his definition of success? And he said, by any measure, if the people in life who should love you don't love you, you have not been successful. Uh, and I'd probably say uh, something will say that I've heard many of my contemporaries, many, many now of my contemporaries who've been very successful will say that uh, pretty decent people and everything. But very often something you'd hear is, I regret that I didn't spend enough time with the kids when they were growing up. Uh, and uh, they, it wasn't that they deliberately didn't do it, but they didn't prioritize it, so it didn't happen. Uh, and uh, I'd be a little bit more optimistic about um, <laughs> happiness than you would. Uh, and, uh, and probably, if you, if you like, if you got down to sort of what everybody wants to do in life, broadly, they want to be reasonably happy. And some of the things, there's a fair amount of research on this, what are the things that tend to lead to happiness in people's lives. One will say, loving and being loved. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and that's pretty well fundamental to the vast majority of the human race. A second one is clarifying, really clarifying what's important to you in life and giving it your best shot as judged by yourself. You know, but the importance of the cons paper will say, what's important to you? It's not what other people think you should or you should not be doing. It's what's important to you. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm using the you now in the sense, the family unit. Uh, and, uh, and then once you've clarified what's important, absolutely giving it your best shot. So, uh, the, you know, that so will say that, uh, you, you know, when you're sitting um, at your rocking chair, like at 90 odd, like reviewing your life, that you actually had a go at the things that were important to you. It actually, by the way, doesn't really matter if you slipped up here and there. It's not having a go at things that were important to you. That they're the ones that would gall you. And the third one, uh, and it's, it's actually something that's perhaps less obvious, contribution, trying to make a significant difference to, to others in some form or another. Now, this may be managing the local GA team, going, going refing, you know, that may be contributing finance, may be contributing time, whatever. They are the things. It's extraordinarily satisfying to make a real difference to others. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something. Uh, and as well as that, if you actually get involved in the voluntary type sector, you will meet some remarkable people because the quality of the people that we live our lives with is hugely important, I think, we'll say that. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I'd even suggest, um, Mr. Chairperson, Mrs. Chairperson, that uh, if, if we focus on those, happiness may be slightly more than fleeting. <laughs> but that, 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 that's a view on life. <laughs> Now, Shan, do you like to...? Yeah, I ju it's just reminded me of something. When we did the wealth creation course in 2016, we had um, a farmer come in. I think he's spoken here as well. He's a young, young man. And when he did the wealth creation course a number of years before, he was of the opinion before he went to the course that he wanted to do like everybody else and have several units and all this type of thing. 
When he dealt with Com then and asked the big why, he realised that he didn't want several units. He had 300 cows at the time. And he did sit down and thought, actually, that's enough. And so he decided to milk them once a day. And he, and he, came, he came to speak to the group. And he said he's probably the laziest farmer there is. He's incredibly successful, you know, financially and all that. But he, he spends time with his children, he has hobbies, and he's a really happy man. And I remember we tried to work out in the course, and I can't remember, it was something like cow hours per day or something, and his was disgraceful, really. Yeah, 10, that's right, it was 10, 10 hours a week, wasn't it, or something like that, he spent with his cows. And, um, but he said, you know, and, but he was happy, and it was because he realised that he didn't want to be competing with everybody else. He wanted to spend time with his kids. He, he's got lots of hobbies. He plays rugby, he does all that sort of stuff. And that's what he wanted to do. And he had enough money to be able to do it. And so, you know, who are we to say that he was not successful? You know? It's a very interesting point. I was reading a book recently where they uh, said, be careful that you don't equate being relaxed with being lazy. And it's a kind of a thing that we can get into. We can get into this treadmill in our heads that if we're not going and doing something and it's attached to work that we're actually being lazy, so that's ridiculous, you know? And I mean, the, I think the lesson that we've got from both of the papers of both presentations is that we need to prioritize, work out what's important and prioritize and really look after them. So I'm going to thank our two speakers, Aidan and Shan. Thank you so much. Um,